Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, Libraries in Response uh, in our current series, uh, Broadband from Space. Uh, we started it last week with a presentation from uh, Dan York of the Internet Society uh, on their year-long study on LEO uh, systems. Uh, and that is uh, recorded and available uh, on the GLN GLN uh, website under Libraries in Response, where we posted it. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, and we are uh, joined in this uh, this three year, nearly three year uh, Zoom venture, uh, exploring a number of different topics, technology, and libraries, uh, communities, digital divide, the rest of it. Uh, with uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague. And our series sponsor uh, is the Internet Society. Thank you, Dan and Internet Society for helping us do these. And our media sponsor is the Broadband Breakfast. We uh, have been active in libraries and connectivity for a number of years. Uh, we're, we're just big on libraries because we find they are the the hub or the vector of so many issues, so many important issues uh, in, in every community, uh, and from infrastructure to access, equity, education, uh, speech and privacy. I mean, you name it, and somehow uh, it relates to libraries. So they're they're very special, they're, they're unique. We call them the, the Swiss army knife of public institutions because they can do pretty much anything that their communities want them to do. Uh, they're, they're not as, confined by specific charters as other institutions like schools and clinics and so on. So um, today we have uh, presentations from uh, uh, SpaceX Starlink and from Amazon Kuiper about their systems, their plans, their existing services and uh, services that are continuing to evolve uh, and present. So we'll, we'll get to Erica and Christopher shortly. This is the series uh, exploring the potential of this emerging technology. Uh, there are a number of open questions. They're well articulated in the in the Internet Society report, which I urge everyone to to read. It's linked through the last session and on the on our website. Um, what we're focusing on with these series is these areas of the potential for LEO to expand. Uh, access to these various uh, services. We have public information, eGov services as a stand-in for library because it's hard to describe the single thing that libraries do with uh, access, but they provide that to tens of millions of people in the US rely on libraries and many, many more around the world. Uh, and also uh, the use, which is a, a special point of emphasis for us is not only expanding the access, but to in, increase resilience against various kinds of disasters and outages, which occur at increasing rate due to uh, severe weather events driven by climate change. And so we're seeing that that role of libraries as so-called second responders uh, rising up and, uh, and uh, the idea that a uh, uh, satellite connectivity uh, uh, could remain live even while everything else is out in a disaster scenario would be incredibly valuable and of course closing the digital divide and how does this in, impact the wider telecommunications system you know what does it do to all the everybody else's business models to have this new unique type of infrastructure enter the enter the picture it it's it it's not for everyone it can't handle that much but it could be for anyone just because of its ability to connect anywhere and so this is our uh, broadband from space calendar. Uh, these are the, the sessions that we have uh, planned uh, today, December 9th. We have the presentations from, from uh, Starlink and Kuiper. Uh, these Don, are- kind of, We're not seeing any slides. Don, we're not right? seeing your slides. Man, wish somebody had spoken up, but uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, but we've seen the same slides. Now, now, this is new stuff. No, not entirely. So now? 
No. 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 Your screen. Yes. No. All right. Okay. We're just going to do this uh, verbally, and I'll try to be concise and create these. Uh, Which um, screen are you sharing, Don, when you're clicking that you're sharing your screen? Uh, yeah, you may be, you have to share the my, right screen. My PowerPoint. No, I meant, no, she's talking about uh, using oh, dual monitor. And that's why you may not be sharing the right screen. Am I what? Using a dual monitor. No, I'm not. But let's just go with your audio summary then. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Well, sorry about that, folks. Well, this won't take but uh, a couple of minutes more here. So we've identified three rationales for uh, investing in LEO evaluations. We think everybody should be trying it out. And the, the first one is that there's really not much else. You're out at the end. There's no, you know, barely any DSL or anything. So it's comparatively the best choice out there if it performs well, and it seems to. Or you've got fiber coming, or you're going to have an upgrade, but it's going to take three to five years just because these projects are slow. Well, as an interim solution, because you could theoretically go live within a couple of weeks, and then uh, you would be able to uh, uh, keep this in reserve, which is the third rationale. Uh, even after you had a, a, a landline connection that you thought was better, cheaper, faster, whatever, you would still have the, uh, the dish in reserve in the event of uh, some kind of outage and you could go live. And that has happened. Uh, one of our projects in Montana had a, had a line cut. Was, there's was fiber to the whole region. The fiber was cut and even the cell providers were out. So the only place in little Anaconda, Montana that had live connectivity was the little library because the, the dish was you know impervious to uh, terrestrial interruptions. Uh, we've identified three main barriers to adoption. And this is kind of the larger case for what we're talking about here. There's, so there's availability, there's affordability and there's usability. So if it's not available, it really doesn't matter how much it costs. I mean, the other points are moot. For the first time, LEO systems seem to be able to deliver available broadband almost anywhere. So that's a big deal. So then we get to the affordability. That's still an open question. Is it affordable? Well, it, at a hundred and roughly $100 a month, that's not affordable to a lot of people. And there are a lot of people that are not connected. You know, some 3 billion people are not yet participating in the internet. So uh, our notion, of course, is that that's what libraries do. They, uh, they uh, pool resources and share them in the community. So they can, they resolve the affordability question in part for, well, for anyone. Uh, and that's a big deal. And then usability is also a library specialty where they support people uh, in, in uh, access, logging in, setting up accounts, uh, devices, skills training, the rest of it. So those two things, LEO systems and public libraries or community centers have the potential to address all three of those barriers, uh, availability, affordability, and usability. And we think that's pretty special. So we're going to go with the uh, we're going to go with our presenters here, and so I'm not really having to unshare since I'm not sharing in the first place. <laughs> so we are going to try to go with uh, with uh, Erica's slides. Let me had a couple more people waiting. And let me just see if I can load Erica's slides. But if I couldn't share those, I can't share this. 
So if Erica's co-host, she can lower her own slides. She's not. She's dialing in. Uh, I think this we may have a record number of cock-ups on this particular Zoom session, uh, but uh, Erica, uh, Erica's company doesn't permit the use of uh, Zoom, interestingly. And so we aren't, I've got another possibility here. Um, I think what we'll do is reverse the order and ask Chris to come on first while I try to load Erica's uh, slides. And so Chris, if you're ready and certainly able, because you were able to share earlier, you can take us away. So I Christopher, excuse me, Christopher, Chris is with Amazon and the Kuiper system, and it's going to tell us all about that. Chris, please, welcome. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Don. Um, I am, you know, kind of with the expectation that I was going to go second, I did make a kind of a somewhat of a bridged um, presentation to kind of avoid the kind of fundamental, you know, duplication of kind of the fundamental basics of what a Leo system is and looks like. So I'm happy to go ahead, but if you want to, I can bear with you for another minute. If you want to try to get um, Erica's slides up, I, I defer to you. But if it's, if you All prefer, right, like, well, I can go me, ahead and dive uh, on in as well. Let me see if I can do that then. Okay. Uh, it's like one minute and if it's a problem, I'm happy to just go ahead and dive in and, and, okay, and well, spare everyone's time. Why don't you, why don't you give us a, uh, uh, I know we're going to ask Dan. Dan, why don't you reset LEO technology kind of overview for us in a in a couple of minutes? Can you do that for us? <laughs> You're on, Dan. Uh, okay, sure. Yes. So, um, well, hi everyone. Welcome. Um, <laughs> thank you for attending this session um, that we have here. The Internet Society is proud to sponsor this um, this series it's coming out of the Gigabit Libraries Network. And, and we're delighted about this one in particular with both uh, folks from SpaceX and Amazon uh, here. Um, the Internet Society, as you're probably aware, has been around for about well, for 30 years, working on, on helping build a bigger, stronger Internet for everyone. We see uh, great potential in, um, in low Earth orbit satellites like as, a, as a way to go and connect um, the people, connect the unconnected, and, can, and provide a better and stronger solution for connectivity around the world. Um, as Don mentioned, and I'm not going to go too much into, it, but we did have a session the last last uh, week session where we talked a bit about our our paper that you can get at Internet Society.org slash Leo's our document, which we provided some perspectives on sort of where things are at and what's there. Um, I, Amazon, um, Chris in particular, um, and uh, and SpaceX are both organization members of the Internet Society, and so they did have a chance to see what we were doing and to be involved in that, and and we welcomed their feedback along with many people from our community. When you look at a LEO satellite system, it's really, I mean, the, the difference from traditional internet um, from space is that in with the, the kind of satellite access we've had for most of 20, 30 years now has been through geostationary satellites that are out at about 36,000 kilometers away from the surface of the earth. And so in those environments, um, the good news on one level is that there's just a single satellite or, or maybe three satellites that give you a, a circle around the earth. You point your satellite antenna at it and you, you get a con connection. It's relatively simple and straightforward from that perspective. The, the challenge is that it, it, there's a lot of lag, a lot of delay. It takes, we can't change the physics of light. It takes a lot of time to get all the way out to a geo satellite and back, typically around 600 plus milliseconds. And that's not something that you could have, you couldn't do this, this call you couldn't be part of this over a uh, over a, a geo connection. It just wouldn't work or give you that kind of capacity. So low Earth orbit satellites or LEO satellites are yes. we get to have this, Don. Um, the uh, the um, You're great, Dan. yeah, no, no, they involve a a mesh of satellites that are that are basically a whole constellation, as the terminology is, that is used. Um, to go all over the earth there's i think sat, um, spacex is now up over 3500 satellites that they have in orbit uh, one web has about 400 in their constellation that's going up there now there are others that are being planned as we're, we'll hear about amazon's project kuiper and others which again will send thousands ultimately tens of thousands of satellites around around the earth to create these low latency high speed connections and that's really the beauty of the leo environment is that you can be able to have that kind of 
low latency, you know, it's, it's not, not as fast as a fiber connection, you know, where you might have like 10 or 11 seconds of milliseconds of, um, of latency, but it's 40 or 50 milliseconds. It's certainly within the realm of what's possible for, for real time communication in all these different forms. I do have to say, this is actually the first time in my life I have ever presented with a barking dog, but uh, thank you God for giving me this new experience. I could check this box off of post pandemic. I knew you were waiting that. Yeah, Dan. Right. You know, it's this is something I've always put made sure I was presenting somewhere where the dog was not. Anyway, um, <laughs> but that's the, the the thing about Leos. The important parts around this are that you have the Leo constellation, you know, that is set up and operated by vendors such as SpaceX and the Amazon Project Kuiper, OneWeb, Telesat. There's about a dozen other vendors who are looking to launch their systems in some ways. You also have the ground terminal, which is what we often typically think of as an antenna. In, in just kind of normal speech, but it's a little bit more than that and may have additional equipment with it. The big difference that, that Leo's have brought about is that you don't just, you don't point the antenna at the satellite like you would for a, you know, a TV or something like that, or with a geostationary satellite, because the satellites are moving. And so the, the ground terminals, the, the, the antennas are what are called electronically steerable. They can track multiple different satellites that go across the earth in different ways. And it, you've, seen i'm sure the the starlink antennas because they're they've been in many different places and you just you point them in the general direction or actually you if the app points it it figures out the right place to go and it's there and it tracks the satellites and does all that kind of stuff and then the third part that people need to be aware of is what are called the ground stations or gateways where the satellite constellation connects to the rest of the internet so for a system to work you wind up with you need your ground terminal you know, if I were a Star, if I were a Starlink customer or a Kuiper customer or any customer, I would have my ant antenna, which would connect me up to the constellation, which would then connect to a ground station, which would bring me access to the rest of the internet. So all of those are those three different parts: the the, the terminal, the constellation, and the ground station are the three pieces we need to to make a Leo system work. Uh, they also involve different levels of government uh, regulation, government policy, things like that that happen. Um, and and those are those are the parts that make it all uh, all happen. So, how was that, Don? That's pretty good, Dan. Uh, on the fly with no prep and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and no notice. I, that's great because you know, um, Chris. Happy to jump in there, Don, and, and uh, great, thank you, Dan, great. for that uh, that great uh, impromptu uh, uh, explanation there. Sorry to, to put you it, on the spot. There's another there's another uh, uh, shift here, Chris. I have just sent you a slide deck, and since you, I can't seem to share for some reason. Okay. So uh -huh. I'm going to ask you if you would do a screen share of Erica's slides. Uh, happy to do that. Bear with me one minute. You know, All this right. is just a, you know, just a great example of, uh, you know, seemingly um, competitors in one field. Happy to, oh, actually, I see it. There before. we go. All I right. think you're up. Okay. Erica, I hope you're still with Save us, right? speech. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm happy. I'm excited to um, meet with everyone right. and to present. Okay. Um, <clears throat> while you're there on, may be, Erica, um, Chris is, Chris is uh, advancing your slides. So that's where we are. I'm, I'm not actually Don. I was I was about to go check my email. This is not from me. This is this is someone else's computer. Someone else. Ah, uh, okay. This yeah. is <laughs> Ifla Meet Eight. All right, you're you're off the hook of having yeah. to run a slideshow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Can Erica. Can you all hear me? Can you hear? If you could speak a little more loudly, please. Okay. Turn up my. Um. So I'm super excited to meet with everyone and speak about um Starlink and the services that we have and um, really excited about not only what we offer, but what we're going to be offering um, in the near future. Um, I'm very passionate about education and um, technology. I'm a former uh, teacher. I used to work at the FCC on E-rate, um, on and e rate related issues. And I was the deputy general counsel at USAC uh, working on compliance and reducing waste, fraud and abuse in all of the universal service programs. So this is very near and dear to my heart. Um, one of the things I'd like to underscore, and we can go to the next slide. Um, and you, some of you all may have seen these slides before, but I'm gonna give a bit more color commentary and updated information. Um, 
what's wonderful about working at SpaceX is things um, change um, and innovation is happening every day. So we have um, announcements kind of on a regular basis. Um, really, we're providing a um, low latency service um, as, uh, as was previously described, which makes, that's the game changer really is the latency as well as the connectivity and the speeds that we're offering. Um, next slide, please. Um, this slide really gives like an overview of where we are currently. We're in over 40 countries. And um, when we say we have global coverage, but we have to um, also navigate getting the actual licensed approval to operate in each, each country. So we're currently in over 40 countries um, operating. We have done over 180, this is actually a little bit more than that now, launches. We have over 3,600 satellites. We have um, almost a million customers. And um, these two speeds that are listed here are because we have multiple types of equipment. So we are getting 50 to 150 megabits of service on our residential standard equipment. And then we're getting 350 and more um, megabits per second on our high performance equipment, which I think is probably um, most apropos for the use case that we're speaking about today, which is working with libraries and or schools. Next slide, please. This slide really just provides like an overview of um, our architecture and really speaks to um, the conversation um, that just proceeded. Um, our first constellation will have about 4,400 satellites um, and they're broken into different um, tiers of um, network or different orbits. And then we've just received approval for 7,500 more satellites. So one thing to remember is the satellites that we launch and we're launching about two batches of satellites a month, um, they're only gonna last for about five years and then they'll be deorbited and they will um, disintegrate. And so as we deorbit satellites, we will be replacing them with whatever is the most up-to-date version of the satellite that we have. Um, so currently the satellites that we deploy now have um, not only do they have the typical satellite um, configuration, but they have optical inner satellite links or um, space lasers that also speak between um, the satellites. And that's what's forming that mesh network. It's not just the satellites, but also the space lasers speaking between them. The approval that we have for the additional satellites is not only to launch more satellites, but also to launch an upgraded version of our satellite. So that satellite will provide higher throughput and higher connectivity and also allow us to um, serve more people in an area. So we're very excited about those, um, those developments. Um, we'll start, we will start launching those satellites um, in the very near future. Um, in addition, um, we don't have any contracts. So meaning like when, when one um, signs up with us on norm, in a normal situation, they're, they're not held into any contract with us. Um, I think that's like kind of really all I wanna talk about on this particular slide. Um, so this next slide is our, the residential kit, which I think people have some familiarity with. Um, they either are using this on their home and or this can also be used in what we call our RB scenario, which is on a recreational vehicle, which allows you to take it places. In, um, on June 30th of this year, we received our Earth Station in Motion license, which also allows us to offer mobile services. So we're now not only offering stationary and portable services, which is our RV offering, but we also have um, mobile services. So the use cases for um, Starlink have really um, changed because of that. We're now on cruise ships. We're now, because we have service everywhere in the world, we're now on sh cruise ships. We're also now on planes. Um, so there, there's, there's Starlink for aviation and maritime as well. 
Um, the next um, slide is really the slide I think is germane to this conversation is really what I, I'm super excited about, which is our high performance terminal. This is a larger terminal that has a lot more capabilities than the standard um, terminal. So that standard kit is used for like everyday residential people just being able to, in a very turnkey scenario, turn on the internet. But we had a lot of people um, speaking to us about wanting to have much more um, complex um, capabilities using Starlink. And so we developed this high performance terminal, which has a much higher throughput um, and then it's also configured to be used as a networking device. So this, this terminal operates as a layer three net networking device. Um, when you receive this terminal, you get an IPv4 address. Um, this terminal can be used for um, not only getting uh, higher throughput and having um, many users on this terminal, but it also can be used for backhaul. It can be bonded with other terminals. So we have scenarios where um, people are bonding um, two or more of these terminals to get even higher throughput in a location. So that um, these new capabilities coupled with the new satellites that we'll be, we will be launching will really explode the capabilities that we're um, able to offer to people. Um, and as you know, or maybe you don't know, if you already have, our previous equipment, that quit equipment is able to receive higher throughput than you currently enjoy. And so as we update the network, you will experience the higher throughput as well. Um, so next slide. You know, we obviously are really excited about um, the products and services that we offer and really think they're wonderful for the um, educational use um, not only here in the United States, but throughout the world. So we have multiple scenarios where we're being employed in schools. As I indicated though, um, many of the, um, what is it that I'm gonna say this, um, many of the schools and libraries that are currently connected with Starlink are with that standard kit. Um, and whereby if, if one is using that kit, I would switch, or if I was contemplating purchasing Starlink, I would purchase the high performance terminal so you could get a lot more throughput at your location and have a lot more users on the terminal at once. Um, let's see, I think people are sending me questions. Can we go through the questions when I'm, when I'm finished? Yeah, I'm it's at the end, we're just, we'll, we'll... Okay. okay, perfect. So this is this slide just speaks to a few um, use cases. Um, this I'm going to start with the one in the middle. Like this is an island school where um, people during COVID did not have access to the internet at, at home, and so we were able to provide connectivity to um, students and teachers in their homes um, so that they could continue learning during COVID. Um, we did a project in East Carroll Parish in Louisiana again, helping to enable distance learning during COVID. Um, and then we have uh, numerous projects um, with tribal communities throughout the United States. And this one focuses on some of the work that we're doing with Navajo Nation and um, some of the chapter houses there and, and, and the members of those chapters providing um, connectivity there. Um, next slide, we also have telehealth applications. We have a project um, that we're doing in Kentucky where people who had no access to broadband now not only have broadband, but are um, using it in concert with some applications to monitor their health. This is a project that has like seniors um, that are using the broadband to seniors with health issues, monitoring for health. Um, we're in like mobile clinics and you know, we speak to people on a regular basis who are trying to not, not just use broadband in their home, but use broadband out in the community, especially these remote communities. Um, there's not just the um, health case. Um, next slide is around like some of those, um, those mobile clinics and such. We'll slide after this one, sorry. Kind of gets to some of the, um, those mobile and remote use cases um, that we're participating in. 
um, next slide is um, the rapid response scenario. So you know, we're living in a world where there are increasingly more um, disasters, um, uh, environmental related disasters. So we've been like dispatched all over the world. Um, you know, wildfires are now like occurring, um, not just in the United States, but also in Europe. So we've been um, deployed out in Europe as well as the United States, mostly Western parts for um, not only just addressing the issue when it is initially happening, but also for like the disaster recovery and response efforts afterwards. Um, also like when people have been displaced, helping to um, set up um, clinics and set up uh, hotspots out in the community so that people have internet access. Um, you know, one of the things that happens after you have a disaster is you now need to upload all of this insurance information and they want pictures and all these things. Well, you've been displaced. So how does one do that? So working with different communities to help um, help them configure opportunities for people to be able to um, access the internet um, and, and use it after those, in those you know, scenarios, um, which has been very rewarding to work on um, these projects. Um, next slide. These are just some of the places um, that we've done these projects, but I mean, this could be all, all over the world. Um, really just, uh, and again, very satisfying work because of the impact that having broadband um, has in these kind of scenarios, not just for the people who've been displaced, but for the first responders who are trying to, to act, to help um, putting, you know, trying to build the bridges back, trying to build the roads back, trying to find the people, trying to um, help them get out of where they are. Um, the internet is instrumental in being able to do those kinds of things and also put the logistics together to be able to implement that, um, those efforts. Um, we're also like working on the drones and being able to have drones that fly and have sensors with IOT to be able to sense fires um, and then dispatch people to try to identify these fires early on and then dispatch people to put them out before they spread and, and get widespread. So trying to also work on some preventative measures around some of these um, scenarios. And then it's not on here, but we have over 21,000 kits in the Ukraine, which I'm sure people have heard a lot about. But these different use cases also speak to the need for different kinds of um, product, which is I think why we've um, started to develop some of the other products that we have. Um, like the mobile offerings um, and really just our team of researchers and engineers is always looking for new ways to use this technology to better people's lives. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, and then in regards to specifically libraries and um, schools, I'm really excited about the opportunities, not just to be a disruptor and provide services, places, um, that don't have um, broadband or high-speed broadband, but be a disruptor as far as the price point. Um, if you look at um, what people are paying for much, much less, um, much less capabilities, it's actually, you know, really sad. It's it's necessary because that's the cost of service in those areas. But we will be a disruptor because you know we're we're going to be much more cost-effective, and and that's born by like some of these backhaul projects we're working on where people are using C-band, which is a form of geosatellite for backhaul in like northern regions of the world. And, and now they'll they'll be using LEO and it, we're, we're much more cost effective. So they'll be able to provide more connectivity at, at less prices, which frees up money for other things. Um, so it's, it's exciting. Um, I can speak directly to some of these questions if you could pose them to me, Tom. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for putting up your uh, email address there, Erica. Uh, I'm, I'm presuming that's an invitation for people to send questions to you directly. <laughs> Not? Erica? Erica, did we lose you? No. You're muted, Erica. Oh, sorry. No, sure. Yeah, right, I'm, I'm a very right. transparent. Well, we, have, open we have quite person. a few questions. 
quite five big questions here. Uh, uh, first one is uh, IPv6. Are you supporting that and, and uh, firewall in the systems? We issue what's called a sticky IPv4 address. Um, I'm calling it sticky because those those addresses are issued in a dynamic fashion, but we, so it, when we issue the address, I guess it continues to be um, issued. What we do is that first address that is issued to you, we continuously issue the same address to you. So therefore that's the sticky nature of the address, but it is an IPv4 address at this time, not an IPv6. Okay, okay. Um, uh... Several relate to kind of pricing and, uh, well, let me first uh, try to uh, get to Cheryl's interesting idea about libraries checking out units uh, as they check out, you know, portable hotspots. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it conceivable? Oh, I, yes. I want to just address the firewall. Okay. We, those are all, those are all kinds of applications that can be added to a network. Uh, we don't come with any of those kinds of things. So when oh. you purchase one of our kits, you get the routers, you get the um, the cables and, and the Ethernet stuff and all that kind of connectivity that we make, but you don't get something like a firewall. But you can oh. bring any firewall you want to your network. Right. Okay. Fair enough. So um, this concept that libraries check out various kinds of connectivity devices for people they're, they're checking out millions of uh, check out hotspots cell connected you know uh, routers uh mm -hmm. it, it can you see a scenario where a library would buy a number of units and then check out the dishes to patrons and even if they did and they charged some small fee for it would do you think that would be uh, in violation of any license agreements Let's say a library. Bought. So there's two, there's two pieces to that. Can I see yeah, that? Yeah. I absolutely can see it. Um, I don't know like whether our T's and C's or terms and conditions like completely allow for something like that right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I mean, what I love about working at SpaceX is there's flexible and just because something hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't ever be done. Right. So yeah, I mean, it's an interesting it's kind scenario. Of like on that. The possible, you know, right? Given the given the cost of the of the uh, dishes themselves and the licenses, it would be extraordinary. Uh, but anyway, uh, we'll we'll look for an update on that. So uh, there's the of course there's the e rate question. Uh, uh, you know, where do you have status on the application for a spin uh, to be an e rate provider? That is something um, I can say that that is something that's that's um, in the works. I'll put that in the way. works. Yeah. Okay. In the works. Um, related to that is uh, uh, the RDOP appeal. Is there any status on that? Let Let me background that uh, the Rural Development Opportunity Fund was a program where providers were subsidized to serve areas unserved initially. Uh, SpaceX, Starlink was uh, awarded uh, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to serve those areas, and it was rescinded. Uh, and Starlink is appealing that decision. Uh, one of the requirements under that program was that the provider become a E-rate provider. And since that was lifted, then that requirement has been lifted. And so it seems to have decrease the motivation of Starlink to go through the hoops of be, uh, becoming an E-rate certified provider. So do you know anything well, you about know, you? Go ahead. Well, well I, I'll tell you two things. So from just an FCC, my FCC background, you don't need to become an E-rate provider until you're actually provisioning service. So on pursuant to a particular program, and you have a time period to be able to do that. So under RDOF, um, service providers had an initial milestone. I believe it was four years to complete, uh, of, I believe 40% of their, three years to complete the first 40% of their network. And so at that time is when they would need to start bidding 
on E-rate projects in the in the areas where their network was deployed. So that would have been the requirement um, under RDOF. Um, um, just okay. to one, one, one last question, we want to get to Chris here, but it, it relates to uh, uh, system capacity. And you mentioned these uh, markets that are, you know, it's a very dynamic uh, situation. We just read a couple of days ago, there's a new government uh, division of Starlink. And uh, there are these uh, higher performance services like for ships and, and super yachts and airplanes, all uh, seemingly requiring quite a, quite a bit of guaranteed capacity to justify these very high uh, prices. We don't know about the government service, but the, but the uh, ships at sea apparently uh, have to use, I don't know, laser to laser satellite communications so they don't rely on ground stations and so uh, thereby can justify a five thousand dollar a month service well what is it seems that uh, uh that uh, starlink is sort of migrating towards higher margin markets as opposed to the unconnected the people that have the greatest difficulty both from availability and affordability uh having this so can you say something about how capacity is managed and, and what the expectation is? Because there's a lot of reports recently that there have been declines in the in the uh, service level, but yet it should be understood that this is a growing constellation and presumably that's increasing capacity, even as demand is putting pressures on that. What can you say about capacity project projections, Erica? So the first thing I will say is that um, we applied for the additional constellations and the second generation um, satellite well over a year ago. And, and those are developments to help with all of these things. I don't, so just in the time that I've been here and the focus that I am working on as all of these other things happen, I don't see it as um, SpaceX focusing on the higher margins, I see it in a very different way. I see it as SpaceX starting with residential service and then adding these other things. So we are committed to residential service. That is like the foundation of our network, right? And the efforts that the um, market access team are making is to get us regulated in all of these other countries for residential service. So I, I don't see it that way at all. I mean, we are, and maybe it's because, you know, I'm 51 and most of the people here are younger, but people are enthusiastic about the impact that we have on people's lives. Um, we don't sit and talk about this, you know, the service on a plane. We talk about the service in Chile. To the schools that you know in the in the mountains and in these tropical rainforests that otherwise don't have service that's what gets us out of the bed in the morning and gets us excited so are we expanding to these other areas sure but that's not the foundation of our network and that's not the foundation of our our company and that offering that we have i think you will see in the near future not only you know launch of these higher um, level satellites but i think you're going to see some other developments that underscore that commitment to residential service um i also feel like ardoff was the company signaling their um desire to provide residential service to the unserved we now cover all of the world which means we're covering the northern region of the of the world um, those are areas, remote areas. I'm specifically working on projects in remote areas in the United States, uh, Alaska, as well as in Canadian provinces that they, they don't have they don't have other options for broadband. And so having Leo is going to be transformational to what they do. So I, I don't look at it from that viewpoint. I look at a very exciting, open um, I mean, I'm a very open person, but I, I, I just look at all the amazing things that we're doing and the projects. Like I just was speaking to people in Africa for a backhaul project to places that would have no broadband. So yeah, it's exciting what we're doing. 
and that's Very for good. people. Airport. It's not for ships and cruise ships and planes. It's for people. Very good. Very good. Thank you. I, uh, pardon my prompting you, uh, but uh, oh, no problem. Great response. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, Christopher, you are up. Uh, we may run over a few minutes. We started a few minutes late, so we'll still try to keep it around an hour. But uh, uh, take it away, Chris. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Don. Thanks for the invitation to uh, be here today. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, and 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 thank you to uh, Dan and the Internet Society for their uh, not only their sponsorship of today's events, but uh, the uh, all the great work they've done in producing the report and and drawing uh, some attention to this uh, really cool and exciting technology. Um, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time, so I do. I'm I'm going to give kind of a a, a relatively brief um, presentation, but want to hit some high notes uh on uh on project kuiper so um they're with me here can everyone see my screen yes we do great thank you so just in brief what is project kuiper uh project kuiper is a it's a constellation of about 3200 satellites in low earth orbit that will provide high quality broadband to tens of millions of unserved and underserved communities around the world. Uh, and when I say high quality broadband, what I mean is, is, is broadband service marked by high speeds, high bandwidth, low latency, and uh, affordability. Um, you know, if anyone's ever uh, bought anything on the Amazon marketplace or bought a, uh, a Kindle or a Fire tablet, we know that, um, you know, affordability is a key tenet uh, of our company and everything that we do uh, in Kuiper will be no exception to that. Um, so briefly, I just want to talk about some of our, our, our potential customers. Um, uh, you know, so Project Capture is going to have you know, terabytes of capacity that can be configured in, in many different ways to meet uh, needs of, of, of different types of customers uh, all around the world. Um, we'll deliver high speed, low latency, and affordable broadband connectivity to a range of customers ranging from individual households and small businesses. Uh, particularly those in remote and rural areas, um, to large telecom operators. Um, some of you might have seen that we've uh, we have an MOU with Verizon in the United States to expand the reach of their 4G LTE and 5G services uh, to rural communities. Um, and then, uh, you know, connecting to the Internet of Things, um, supporting emergency services, um, and then certainly public se sector uh, customers. Um, really happy to be here today speaking uh, with you all. Um, we certainly understand the, the, uh, the importance of, of, of expanding connectivity as a, as a policy measure, both ranging from local to, to, to national governments. Um, and, and we certainly appreciate how the concept of, of community anchor institutions such as libraries can really uh, be such a key enabler to expanding access in a community. It can really be hubs not only from a, from a technological perspective, but a, but a human perspective as well. Um, and Amazon is certainly committed to, to partnering with anyone in the public or, or private sector um, that shares our commitment to expanding uh, broadband connectivity. Um, I'm not an engineer, but I want to just briefly talk about our, our, our system uh, architecture. Um, our license from the FCC provides access to a range of uh, uh, radio frequency segments in the KA band, uh, which is slightly different um, uh, than our previous speaker. Um, and we intend to use each segment for a, for a separate use. Um, our satellites use software defined payloads that be, can be configured to provide simultaneous data connection to thousands of KA band flat panel antenna uh, within a satellite's field of view. Um, our system will enable up to uh, one gigabit downlink speeds for enterprise customers with an average latency of less than uh, 50 milliseconds. You know, the, uh, the, you know we, we think about when we talk about satellites, we think of everything uh, in outer space, but in fact, you know, um, we say 70% of really what's the, the important part of a, of a satellite system such as this is actually what's happening on planet Earth, um, including terrestrial networking and infrastructure, um, which are such a critical part of the overall system. Um, so, so we can imagine, for example, that, you know, a library or another customer here on the left-hand side, um, with a customer terminal connecting to a Kuiper satellite, which then, uh, in turn hands off the, uh, the, the hands off that, uh, that data to an IXP. And from that on, that point on, um, the service is just like a, you know, high-speed internet you'd get anywhere else, uh, in an, in an urban community. 
So our global network of, of gateway stations will provide a secure data uplink and downlink with a satellite constellation and route traffic to IXPs and points of presence around the world. Project Kuiper in particular will leverage uh, terrestrial fiber and networking systems from uh, Amazon Web Services or AWS, and we'll use AWS to provide secure data, uh, compute, storage, processing, and analytics for customers. Um, just briefly, um, this this kind of just talks about our, our our the global coverage that will uh, that that Kuiper will uh, will will be able to serve uh, from approximately uh, uh, 56 degrees latitude north to 56 south, which covers about 95 percent of the global population. Um, we'll be launching in in five phases, um, kind of starting at where you see in phase one, at kind of the northern and southern extremes of the Earth, moving towards the equator with two initial uh, phases of launch capacity of four and five, uh, just adding uh, additional um, uh, capacity and bandwidth to the system overall. And we uh, we don't have the luxury of having a, 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 a launches in house or spaceships uh, at our fingertips, um, but we have secured launch contracts sufficient to uh, support the launch of our first generation of our system um, using the diversity diversity of uh, suppliers um, and vendors, including the United Launch Alliance, obviously a large uh, uh, American contractor, Ariane Spas, uh, which is based in France, and uh, Blue Origin, which is uh, you know, owned by Jeff Bezos, but to be very clear, uh, different and separate and, and, and not an Amazon company. Just briefly, um, you know, Amazon, you know, it, people think of it as, as, as a leap, you know, why is, is Amazon getting into a, a business such as this? Well, first of all, we know there's, there's a ton of demand. Um, there are billions of people around the world that are unconnected to the, the internet, and we want to do our part to help to bridge that digital divide. Um, but as, as some of you may know, but we, you know, we're, we're, we serve millions of companies or countries, or excuse me, <laughs> millions of customers around the world in a hundred uh, different countries. Um, we have uh, global operations, including physical and digital infrastructure, um, already well skilled in servicing customers, billing and installation, uh, and of course, a, a pedigree of, of deploying uh, cutting edge technology. So we really think we're well positioned uh, to launch an endeavor like this. We've invested over $10 billion uh, to begin with, um, and we're really proud of everything that we're going to, uh, to, everything we've done so far and everything we will do in the future. Uh, I want to stop sharing my screen and then quickly, there's two questions that we always get, and so I want to address those uh, before they're asked. For, uh, they are, when is it coming to my country, and how much is it going to cost me? So uh, understand that I can't uh, answer all those uh, specific questions. The, uh, the terms of our FCC license is that half of the constellation, uh, half of that 3,200 satellites must be deployed by the summer of 2026. Um, so you can kind of infer from, from, from that date when we'll start getting satellites up into the sky. Um, and then once satellites are launched, the, um, they can begin uh, providing a service immediately. Um, we are launching our first two prototype satellites in Q1 of next year, which we're super uh, excited about. Uh, secondly is uh, how much is this going to cost? Um, I, I can't give a good figure just other than to reiterate the point that affordability is a key tenant of everything that Amazon does uh, and Kuiper will be no exception. Um, obviously, it will depend on, you know, if we're partnering with a, a mobile operator in a different country or whether they're going to direct to consumer, uh, so on and so forth. But it, we, we really think that affordability will be uh, one of the uh, kind of defining characteristics of the service that we offer. So, yeah, thank you. Fair enough. Fair enough. Good job, Chris. Uh, so kind of picking up on Erica's uh, testament to dedication to individuals, residents and, and versus uh, businesses or enterprises or anchor institutions, is there any uh, commitment to specific markets or is just they're all just going to sort of unfold as the capability uh, appears? You know, I, I don't uh, want to get too far ahead of anything that we've announced publicly, you know, other than to say, you know, the, the opportunity, opportunities are really only defined by the, the edges of our imagination. You know, we really we understand um the 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 need that's out there you know we have people placed around the globe who are really in touch uh with you know both private and, and public sector at ranging from the community level on up um and so our doors are open our ears are open to, to you know certain you know partnerships and 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 customer bases and and we really want to be out there you know delivering for for customers um that have this great need well, great. We we certainly uh, want to encourage you on behalf of anchor institutions, libraries, mm -hmm. 
schools, community centers to, uh, to uh, focus on that, uh, that market segment subset. Uh, public services, of course, are provided uh, by public entities on behalf of the public, which in fact is the uh, owner uh, of the public airwaves, which are being used by the providers to deliver these services. So right. we think that should be a priority market, uh, but we understand you know, the, the workings of the business and, and the limitations and, and capabilities, the amazing capabilities of this emerging technology. Um, there is a question on that, more or less. It's, it is obviously early, but would you anticipate uh, participating in the E-rate program and, and going through the, the hoops of getting a, uh, a spin eligible? The, yeah, the, the, the answer to will we consider it is, is, is absolutely. I don't have anything to announce as far as steps we've taken or any, any commitments, but we are, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely kind of all, all things are on the table now. Um, I do, I know we are kind of at the end of time. I have typed in my, uh, my email address into the chat. Uh, it's chrhem at amazon.com. Um, please feel free if, if people have uh, uh, questions that they don't even have, have time to ask or um, don't you know, want to ask on a one-to-one on a, on a -one level. I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to field those questions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at the hour, but we're, uh, we start a few minutes late. We're going to take a, a last minute here to uh, let, uh, let you two make uh, any kind of final statement you would. Erica, anything you'd like to close with? Um, I love the comment that Chris made about um, the imagination, because I think that um, you're both working for organizations that um, very much are into innovation and really into addressing the needs of people, um, whatever that, you know, that's a widespread um, swath of, of needs, right, that people have and really developing not only products, but services and subscriptions that will fit into a lot of different um, needs that people have. And so I just I just ask people to kind of like pay attention to what we're doing over like the next six to nine months, because I think you're gonna see um, a lot of really amazing um, offerings and, and changes. Great. We're, we've only been offering our service for like two years, so we're babies at this. And so that expansion is going to be tremendous. Well, excellent. That's to, our, that's to our point that this is new, this is emerging uh, and changing, and yet the potential is just really impressive. Uh, it's clearly groundbreaking technology, uh, and it may be, uh, it may be dramatic impact on, on, the, on the entire uh, ecosystem, which of course is inadequate, the market as it is now to really serve everyone, which is, which is our goal. Uh, Chris, the last word. Uh, if if uh, you know Starlink's a, a baby, we are uh, in utero. But uh, you know the uh, we really think our, our our future is bright. We've made some really uh, groundbreaking technology and advances with our our, our customer terminal, which is going to be uh, more expensive and lighter and easier to install install than than anything that 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 we've seen before. Um, we uh, you know we we've secured our launch capacity. This is really really ready to go, and the future is, is trending uh, in in a great direction. We understand that um you know i think there's going to be multiple winners in this space uh not only uh the two companies on this call but others as well just because the the demand and need and, and available market is 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 so large um and so we're really excited about the opportunity that we have to to play our place and and, and really connecting the unconnected and bridging the digital divide so please be in touch please keep uh, your eyes and ears out for uh, future developments from our company and um, we really again appreciate don the opportunity to be here today so thank you excellent uh, thank you, and thank you both for you know for sharing your perspectives and and as uh, as competing yet cooperating uh, enterprises, it's it's impressive. Uh, you do have a common interest, of course, but then you also have distinct interests, and and so where those converge is uh, where we're happy to host and and uh, open discussion, and we'll be looking to have you back, uh, you know, next year to give us an update on on developments. Um, so this is exciting, uh, just because it's so different and really unique. And the fact that it's independent, uh, I mean, 
ground stations and the backbone of the internet notwithstanding is independent of terrestrial infrastructure is a really special characteristic that we we usually just focus on okay what's the what's the bit rate uh, you know and uh, and the reliability but the fact that it's that it's a unique and separate infrastructure is what's really fascinating to us uh we will pick up that very point on uh january the 6th i believe is the first friday in uh in 2023 uh, and we will focus on this resilience aspect uh we're going to have uh, the story that Erica mentioned on the response uh, to Ian, the hurricane that swept through Florida, devastating huge swath of, of land and where the office of the state CIO uh, acquired hundreds of units to deploy uh, in response so that people had connectivity out in those areas. So that's a response application. We're, we're looking at the, the readiness application and having this kind of capability pre-deployed, pre-disaster, as it were, uh, at places like libraries and schools who act in the role of second responders when things go down, so that would already be there at least at some level in in, in response. And we're going to hear that story uh, as well as uh, on some others when we open with uh, the continuation of broadband from space. In January, uh, the session after that, we're going to get more. We're going to dive more deeply into these application areas of education and health and uh, and general public access. So, stand by and uh, everybody have a great holiday season, and we'll sign off on this uh, really interesting year, <laughs> and look forward to a better one. So, uh, thank you all, and we'll call that a session for today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Don, Thank is you. that Thank possible? You, Don.